On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the Navy finds sailor Ryan Sawyer Mays not guilty of arson on board the Bonham Richard. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to this episode. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, so if you followed my channel, you know that one of my pet issues we've looked at quite a bit here over the year and a half of the channel, and actually before that, go back to July of 2020, even before my channel was up and running, I did two videos on the Bonham Richard fire. And I've been a very vocal critic of the Navy in not just the decision to prosecute this seaman recruit, an E-1 sailor, but how they handled the fire, which I think was absolutely abysmal. I think the bigger issue here is not to try to determine who caused or what caused the fire. Because I have to tell you, ships coming out of shipyard periods, ships in port are ripe for fire on board. It's going to happen, guaranteed. But the Navy's fixation on this sailor I think takes away from the bigger issue, which is what went wrong that day on board the Bonham Richard. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this story. So this is a story over on USNI News, Gidget Fuentes, uh, talking about this, where the judge determined that Seaman Recruit Mays was, was innocent of all the charges brought against him. And I have to say, there was little to no evidence that pointed at him being the instigator for the fire, except for one witness who basically said they saw him maybe 90% chance leaving the area where the fire uh, started. So in the story, uh, Gidget quotes a, a comment from one of the a former Marine who is a defense consultant. Mays, the defendant, quote, feels like he's been a victim throughout the process. Uh, goes on here for two years as the investigator and prosecution continued to portray him as an arsonist, despite May's insistence he was innocent, that, quote, has tainted his motivation and his desire to stay in the Navy. Continuing on, defense attorneys have argued that there's more than enough reasonable doubt in the Navy's prosecution to find him not guilty of the charges. They said he's consistently pressed his innocence and questioned whether it was arson that started the blaze or just an accidental fire sparked by faulty uh, vehicles or lithium-ion batteries that were stored in the area, which sailors and contractors working on the ship had used as a junkyard. This is a quote from his defense attorney, Lieutenant Commander Jordi Torres. There is no open flame that they recovered. Apparently having a lighter makes you an arsonist. The lead prosecutor, Captain Jason Jones, has argued that there was sufficient evidence to convict Mays on both counts. He denied Mays' attorney's contention that investigators and prosecutors were biased in their fervent pursuit of this young sailor. In uh, 2020, Mays was held for three months while they determined whether or not there was sufficient evidence. And at the time, a Article 32 hearing was held, which basically determines whether or not there is sufficient evidence to bring a case. And it was determined there wasn't. And he was released. But then in July of 2021, the Navy brought charges against him. And I have to say, there is little to no charges or little to no evidence that he was involved in this. Fire burned for five days. I got to say, as a firefighter myself, and I know the ATF, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, came in to do the investigation, uh, they found very little evidence, even though they said that it was probably arson, but they had little evidence to prove that. So there was one thing in this story that really struck me, because I had not heard this previously. Investigator Torres said, uh, did not pursue possible links to two other recent fires, a burned mattress aboard the amphibious assault ship Essex, Birth at Pier 8, uh, Bonham Richard was at Pier 2, the afternoon the fire broke out aboard Bonham Richard. So literally the same day that this ship is having a fire, a sister ship of hers had a fire in a bunk. Now, that could easily be due to someone smoking in a rack or, or something. That's, that's, it, it's not uncommon. It also says a few weeks earlier, a small fire aboard Bonham Richard in a cup in an engineering space. And again, that could be somebody smoking where they're not supposed to. So I'm not too terribly surprised about this, but what I'm surprised about is that, again, that they're not looking at bigger pictures here. And I think one of the things that really comes away from me in this investigation is how fixated the Navy became on this seaman and trying to find a single person to blame. 
when in truth it really didn't matter. I know it's going to get some people fired up, and I apologize. Just, just I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter what started the fire. It doesn't matter if it was arson. It doesn't matter if it was an unintentional flame. It doesn't matter if it was an accident. It doesn't matter if it was it was it was workers doing something. You had a fire on board, and you lost a 1.5 billion dollar ship. That should be the bigger issue here, not prosecuting an E1, the lowest ranked person in the hierarchy of the Navy, for arson on board a ship when. The Article 32 hearing said there wasn't enough evidence to go forward with this, and instead they went forward for a two-month trial and put this kid through this for nothing because the, he went up, he decided to not have a jury trial. He just went with the judge's ruling. The judge determined that there was no evidence here pointing this way. All right, let, let's take a look at the evidence here in the past. So these are the videos I've done on the Bonhomme Richard. Uh, quite a few, uh, about six of them I did, and then I included some uh, videos of the day the fires took place. The most recent video I did was on the decision by the Navy to put admirals in charge of firefighting when a ship burns at the pier. That is a ridiculous idea. It just creates a hierarchy that doesn't need to be there. The commanding officer of the vessel on fire should command the fire scene. He should not have superimposed above him an admiral telling him what to do. That's not the way it works. It just doesn't. I did a video on the punishments doled out to the Navy, which we're going to come back to and talk about. Did a two-video uh, series on uh, both the timeline of the fire and then the analysis of the fire, uh, including a commentary and the decision by the Navy Installations Command that the Navy doesn't need fireboats in their major ports, which is wrong. You are wrong. You do not understand what a fireboat is. If the only image you have of a fireboat is spraying a lot of water and sinking the Normandy in February of 1942 in New York, then you don't understand what fireboats do. You just don't because they bring trade personnel. And more importantly, they bring a pump capacity that doesn't have to spray water onto a fire, but can spray, pump water into a ship by large diameter hoses through a manifold system and help you fight your fire. Again, you just don't realize what a, a, a true fireboat can do. All right, let's go ahead and jump over here to one of the big pieces I wanna talk about. So this is a piece on G Captain by ProPublica. Uh, Megan Rose did this piece. Now, ProPublica has been very critical of the U.S. Navy. They had an award-winning piece here uh, a few years ago that looked at the Navy following the Fitzgerald and the McCain uh, collisions back in 2017. They have followed up with this piece that looks at basically the firefighting on board Bonham Richard. And one of the things, I want to read the introduction here for Megan, because Megan Rose does a great job of introducing the scene. On the morning of July 12, 2020, the first orange flickers of destruction took hold in the bowels of the hulking USS Bonham Richard as it sat moored at a San Diego naval base. Unimpeded, the fire gathered for, surging upward, conquering one level of the 844-foot ship and then the next, while the crew, the ship's critical firefighting force, fled to the pier which is true. Eventually the crew had to abandon ship because smoke overtook over the hangar deck and they couldn't stay on board anymore. There the captain, and the captain had not been on board that morning, He, the captain received a text from the command duty officer that his ship is on fire. I so much want to see that text. What is the text that you send to the captain of a ship that the ship is on fire? Again, I, I just, I have to see what this text says. It's, I, I have an idea of what it says, but it can't possibly, what runs through my mind is, you know, ship on fire, poop emoji. I, I don't know. It, it, it can't be good. Anyway, the ship's critical fire, firefighting force fled to the pier. There, the captain and the sailors stood by as Bonham Richard burned in cruel irony of its motto, quote, I have not yet begun to fight. And this firefighting was a terrible, terrible demonstration of what shipboard firefighting should look like. The command investigation that was done on the fire on board really found four major areas of fault during the firefighting on board the vessel. First, they found the material condition of the vessel was a problem. Uh, to give you an example here, they talk about the fact that 87% of the ship's fire stations were inactive that morning. Training and readiness was at fault. The last 14 fires 
or fire drills the ship had, they failed to meet the time standard for applying firefighting agent to the seat of the fire. Not 14 times they failed, the 14 consecutive events leading up to 12 July. Shore establishment support absolutely failed. I, I, I mean, they expected to be supported by uh, the port, uh, uh, Naval Base San Diego, Southwest Regional Maintenance Center, and I will tell you that they were fairly well let down by that. Uh, for the example that I use all the time, when Federal Fire, the, the, the Federal Firefighting Force, those who operate trucks, fire trucks, and man the stations on the base, to fight the fire and coordinate, number one, the uh, crews of Federal Fire did not have adapters so that they can plug in to the fire mains on board Bonham Richard, which really didn't matter because they never flow a drop of water from the fire mains on Bonham Richard. But then they had to basically rig fire hoses from their trucks onto the ship. Well, Pier 2 doesn't have any water on it. There's no water except for a potable water uh, system there that provides drinking water to the Bonham Richard, the, the Russell and the Fitzgerald that were all on the pier there. And then finally, oversight, ineffective oversight by the cognizant commanders across various organizations. I go a little bit further here. The commanding officer, the executive officer, and the command duty officer are the three people who principally, in my opinion, failed this whole evolution. The command duty officer, who's basically operating for the commanding officer when he's off the vessel, should have immediately, immediately put out the fly, you know, dispatch the flying squad, put crews in the firefighting gears and start putting out the fire and coordinating and getting assets from off the ship to support him. He had crews come over from neighboring destroyers. He had Fed Fire arrive on the pier. He had the San Diego Fire Department and two other municipal fire departments come in, but they never do that. And even when the XO and the CO come, they fail at this miserably. So I want to read this part from the report uh, that ProPublica did, because I think it's really damning of, of what happened here. The command investigation, led by a three-star admiral, sent a team of investigators on a prodigious and methodical examination of the fire. As the months passed, the investigators uncovered in exhaustive detail an astonishing array of failures, broken or missing fire hoses, poorly trained sailors, uh, improperly stored hazardous material. Man, there was stuff everywhere in the lower V-deck. This had basically primed the ship for a cal uh, calamitous fire. For example, the ship's crew didn't know whether or not they could wear their uniforms under firefighting gear for fear that they would melt. That should have been ingrained in them at firefighting school. That should have been practiced time and time again in drills. And if it's such a problem, strip out of your gear, strip out of your, your pants and your shirt, and you know, use your skivvies and go fight the fire. This, this should not be an issue. It really shouldn't. Goes on here uh, in the ProPublica piece, a separate investigation by the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. Now, everybody thinks NCIS is Gibbs and, and what you see on TV, it's not. For its part, focused on whether anyone was criminally responsible. As the months pass, NCIS investigators appear to operate in isolation, discounting the damning findings of the command investigation to pursue a case of arson despite scant evidence. Six weeks into both inquiries, the Navy told the command investigation to accept at face value what NCIS and federal fire investigators, this is from the ATF, judged to be the fire's origin. Both investigations concluded in 2021. It goes on here to say the command investigation traced the problems back to when the Bonham Richard docked for maintenance and the Navy leaders throughout the ranks abandoned responsibility for the ship's safety. And that is the key issue. This ship was not in a shipyard. It had come out of NASCO. It had been turned back over to the Navy. There was a duty watch. One of six duty watches were on board. There was a berthing barge behind this vessel where crew could live on board or they could live on the vessel, even though the vessel was undergoing still maintenance and upgrades for its ability to carry F-35B Lightning fighters. It was a commissioned vessel. It was being crewed by U.S. Naval personnel. In other words, it was in the hands of the Navy. It was their responsibility. Command investigation traced the problems back to when Bonham Richard docked for maintenance and the Navy leaders throughout the ranks abandoned responsibility. Risks mounted and nobody paid attention. All told, investigators determined that the action of 17 sailors and officers directly led to the loss of the ship and those of 17 more, including five admirals, contributed. 
the long list was a staggering indictment of everyone from sailors to top admirals who failed in their jobs. So 34 sailors were identified, or 34 personnel, they weren't all sailors, they included civilians ashore, were identified as contributing to the loss of the vessel. This story right here by a G captain talked about the punishments that were handed down. So right here, Admiral Samuel Paparo, commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet in the Consolidated Disposition Authorities. He awarded punitive letters of reprimand and forfeiture of pay to Captain Gregory Scott Thorman, former uh, commanding officer, and Captain Michael Ray, former executive officer, and former command master chief Jose Hernandez was awarded a punitive letter of reprimand. So the captain of the ship got a letter of reprimand and a forfeiture of pay. Oh, by the way, just, you know, just, just, you know, just for fun here, he remained in command of the vessel until he decommissioned it. So he wasn't even relieved of command of the vessel when he lost it in a fire, pierside, in San Diego, when they couldn't get water on the fire for two hours, and they're surrounded by San Diego Bay. I, I, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable goes on here. Additionally, letters of, uh, of instruction were awarded to Rear Admiral Scott Brown, the U.S. Pacific Fleet Director of Fleet Maintenance, Rear Admiral Eric uh, Verhage, Commander of the Naval uh, Navy Regional Maintenance Center, and then, and then the Secretary of the Navy issued a, secretari- a secretarial letter of censure, which is obviously from the Secretary, to Vice Admiral Richard Brown. At the time, Brown was the commander of Naval Surface Forces Pacific Fleet. I- Again, there's obviously a lot of people you can point at for causing this. But again, in the meantime, you're going after an E-1 sailor for arson when all these people failed in their mission to stop a fire that should have been knocked out in the first 12 minutes. I mean, they should have been able to knock this fire out so quickly. And instead, we lose the ship. And for two years now, two years this kid, this E1, has been basically the target of a prosecution that was dismissed with almost no problems, with almost no problems. And it really makes me wonder what's going on with the Navy. And understand, this is going on with the Navy at the time when USS Nimitz in San Diego is dealing with a JP-5, a jet fuel leak, into its potable water tanks, uh, which is, I'm not sure how that even happens. I'm not even sure how that happens. Uh, but that's a big issue. They're dealing with decommissioning of vessels at an accelerated rate because they can't maintain their maintenance. Uh, I've looked at the Navy five-year shipbuilding program on the number of ships they want to add versus the number of ships they want to remove. Their numbers don't even add up. And, and it really raises a question about the Navy. There are a lot of people who are calling for an outside agency to come in and assess the Navy. And there are many within the Navy who don't want that, obviously. They don't. But I love the Navy. Let me be clear. I love the Navy. I've written about the Navy. I work for the Navy. I love the Navy. My wife was in the Navy. I love it. I really do. But it really bothers me when issues like this happens and the Navy seems to just kind of default and have to blame somebody for an incident. They did this with the Iowa uh, back in 1989 when when the gun, gun turret blew up. They blamed a sailor. They always try to identify and blame a sailor. And don't get me wrong, there was a history of arson we had with the Miami fire in 2012 up in Portsmouth when a shipyard worker did it. But in this case, I I mean, again, you're you're in a shipyard period or coming out of a shipyard period, you get a lot of gear around. Fires happen on ships. I've been on ships. Believe me, fires happen all the time. It really does. You have to knock them down quick. And that's part of your response. And this ship failed, failed on every level to get this fire out quickly. And the track record was there. The last fire drills, they weren't able to do it. The readiness wasn't there. Yeah, 87.5% of your of your firefighting gear or your hose stations are out. Well, 12.5 is working. What's your provision? Have you laid hose and prepositioned hose so you can run it long distance? If you had a fire boat, you could bring it in, put it at the stern, run large diameter hose up to the upper V deck and through a manifold hook in fire hoses and and uh, uh, blitz nozzles and fire monitors and you could put this fire out in no time. You could have flooded the lower V. If you flooded the lower V, the fire is out. 
You don't flood the whole ship. You don't spray the top of the vessel. If you look at the imageries that you have, you're spraying the top of the vessel. You're dumping water from helicopters. It's not the way you fight a fire. You got to go in and hit the seat of the fire. You got to hit the base of the fire. Their problem is the fire extended and it got out of control. And they almost capsized this vessel. They don't ever want to talk about this. But this ship rolled from port to starboard. It went from a five degree roll on one side to a five degree roll on the other side. That's not good. That's there's there's negative stability on the vessel at that time. And they're lucky they didn't roll this vessel in San Diego. This issue needs to be hammered home. And it just goes to a larger issue of what's going on with the U.S. Navy, the culture, and what is going on with leadership of the Navy. How is it? Again, I have no personal animosity toward the ship captain. But if you're a ship captain, oh, by the way, you are the executive officer of the ship, too. And then you're fleeted up to be the captain. And even though you're an Airedale, you're a pilot, uh, you should still understand the basic tenets of firefighting. And if you don't, don't become the commanding officer of a ship. Because this is something you're going to have to deal with. And I don't buy the argument that if this ship had been underway with a full crew, it would have been saved. There are issues here that just resonate as problems throughout this. Don't know whether you can wear the gear. Uh, not getting the crews organized fast enough. There was just a breakdown. Nobody hits the AFFF system that would have flooded the area with foam. Nobody even hit, hits the button. It, it's just an unbelievable amount of issues here. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll learn about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page by either hitting that super thanks button below and contributing directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link at the end of the video or down in the show notes and become a patron of the channel. To our next video, this is Sal, signing off.